Alright, right, everybody. Hello. Welcome back. Got a guest here for you today. Um, how was your spring break? Did you guys have a good time? I see you. Pretty good. Pretty good. I see a few sun, sunburns, suntans, right? <laughs> Uh, well, today we have Dr. Aaron Bivens, who just joined our department, so might not know him yet, but it, all the future students are going to know him as part of part of the environmental faculty. So excited to have him here today to share with you some some of his experiences in the field. He's been to Nicaragua, he's been to India, uh, probably some other places that I've forgotten as well. Um, so he's going to share some interesting things about that. He's a microbiologist by training, uh, so it'll be kind of that sort of a flavor. He, you get me here telling you a little bit about the fecal oral route of transmission, stuff like that. But I'm more on the disinfection side, so he'll tell you m probably more about the actual microbes themselves. I'm excited to hear what he has to say. I'll pull up a, a chair in a moment. Uh, as you noticed over the break, I did return your intro paragraph, so we're going to go over those a little more in depth on Wednesday, give you some more kind of writing coaching, tell you what I really meant by the feedback that I gave you. Uh, and talk about kind of my expectations for the next next draft there. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron. Dr. Bivens here, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a microbiologist, but really I'm an engineer. Uh, my my training is really all in engineering. I learned how to be a microbiologist in graduate school, but kind of started out basically not knowing what I was doing. Um, so. And uh, I, I describe myself as a public health engineer because realistically I'm interested in how do we leverage engineering principles to improve public health. Most of my work is microbes. Obviously chemicals are a part of this as well, um, but really diarrheal diseases um, are kind of my bread and butter, so to speak. Um, so, you know, my, my work sits really at this nexus of civil and environmental engineering, environmental microbiology, and public health. So uh, I use different molecular techniques to look for pathogens in different environments in the compartment, or different compartments in the environment. The good news is most of the time pathogens are extremely rare in the environment, which is good for us or else we would all be sick at home right now. Um, the bad news for me as a microbiologist means that I have to work really hard to find them, quantify them, and then use that data to improve our approach to managing public health. So um, one thing that I'll circle back to is quantitative microbial risk assessment. Um, I would say that's just, basically this is a mathematical framework for taking pathogen counts from the environment or from really any compartment. We can measure pathogens in this room right now. And then we use some mathematical techniques to say, okay, someone exposed to this media medium what's the probability that they end up uh, infected. So you can think about you know, something like SARS-CoV-2, right? We know this pathogen that moves in the air. We can measure it in different places. Based on the counts, we can use that information in our modeling, this QMRA, to basically make inferences about, okay, how many people would get sick in this case? Now what if we put a HEPA filter in the room? And we begin treating the air in the room with a HEPA filter. We reduce the SARS-CoV-2 counts. Now, how many people are going to get sick? So you can start to do, you know, cost, cost uh, modeling, cost-benefit analysis, things like that. So we're basically taking environmental microbiology, engineering, and math, and mixing all those all up in a pot together and using it to make decisions. Um, I graduated from 2007 from Georgia Tech. This is me. I was not very happy. I hated undergrad. I was terrible at it. And I swore to anyone that would listen that I would never come back to another university in my life. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, I left Georgia Tech. I took a job as an engineering consultant in Savannah, Georgia, um, which is a lovely place. If you haven't been there, you should definitely go. Spent five years there. Um, as, a, as an engineering consultant, I really, I worked in a very small office, so any project that came through the door, I was involved with. So I did a lot of uh, stormwater design, wastewater design, water distribution, water treatment, wastewater treatment, anything hydraulic. 
um, I was pretty involved in. And through that experience, I earned my en engineering license, um, which is nice to have. After that, I got bored. Um, consulting is fun, but the thing is, like the way consultants make money is, you get really good at doing one thing, and then you just do that one thing over and over and over. The better you get at it, the more money they make off you doing it. So I ended up bored uh, after five years. I, the first three years were really good, but then the fourth year was a repeat of the third year, and the fifth year was a repeat of the fourth year, so it kind of started, it just wasn't interesting anymore. So I, uh, I bailed out of that, came back to Georgia Tech for what I thought was going to be just a master's degree. I was really interested in water treatment, wastewater treatment. So my thinking was, oh, I'll get a master's degree, and then honestly my plan was like, I'm going to get a master's degree, and then I'm going to go abroad and work as an engineer. Um, the only problem is that engineers aren't really the like limiting reagent abroad. Um, if you're going to pick a point to help, uh, there are tons of engineers abroad. Uh, so going and just being another engineer, especially an engineer that's not familiar with that place or that culture or behavior, uh, is really, really difficult and maybe not the best way to add value uh, in the system. So. As I wrapped up my uh, master's degree, I actually really loved graduate school. I was much better at it. Um, and I think part of the reason I was good at it is because I had some professional experience, and so I knew which levers to pull, which questions to ask, because I had some experience to draw from. And so I started my PhD, um, and really this was when microbiology entered my life. It was like 2014. Um, my first set of, uh, you, we have the pour, we have the pour plates to enumerate, enumerate microbes, and my first set of pour plates were like disgusting. They were full of bubbles. I showed them to another microbiologist. They laughed at me. Um, so I really did start from like zero. Um, had a really great experience at Georgia Tech. I uh, made a lot of great friends. This is uh, my friend Rebecca here. Um, she was in a class. I was the TA. Um, and then actually we traveled to Bolivia together and she ended up coming back the next year to be the co-TA, so we ended up ta together um, and we recorded a, an interview together that's now I think like in the Library of Congress, some NPR, I forget what it's called, it's an NPR program, but um, she's super cool, she's working in consulting now, she's actually getting ready to go back to graduate school. Um, this is my friend Akansha here. Uh, I was a Fulbright scholar in India, and Akansha kept me out of a lot of trouble uh, <laughs> by keeping me from doing dumb American things in India. Um, you know, there's there's a lot going on under the surface in our culture, and you don't realize it until you're not in your culture anymore, and you're completely lost. And Akansha kept me from making a fool of myself. Uh, interestingly enough, Akansha is now a professor in India at the National Forensic Sciences University, and we have a student uh, that is leaving here to go work with Akansha as a Fulbright, so it's kind of cool that it's come full circle and she and I are still working together. Uh, this is in India. This is uh, Chon Bowery, which is basically a step well. So this was dug in um, medieval times, basically this one is completely dry, but down at the very bottom here, there would be water. It would fill during the rainy season, and basically you have, you know, you take the steps down as far as you need to go, but this was how they would basically manage water scarcity in the desert of India. Um, this is a this is a squat toilet in Maputo, Mozambique. So this would be considered improved sanitation. I don't know if you've been learning about improved versus unimproved. This would be considered improved sanitation because we have a a uh, latrine slab with a lid to confine the feces in the ground here. Now, you know, if you're like me, the question is, okay, well, this feces is in a hole in the ground, and we know that water moves around in the ground, so uh, maybe, maybe this is safely managed. The WHO er, would definitely classify this as safely managed, but I don't know what that really means. Um, when I think about my microbes, really the, I call this the primacy of observation, but if you think about it, we have our five senses, right? And that's what we use to engage with the world. And microbes, depending upon what tools you have, you may or may not be able to engage with them using those senses. You can't see them. 
maybe sometimes you can smell them depending upon what they're metabolizing, if they're producing sulfur compounds or things like that, you might be able to smell them. But they're very difficult to observe, and so uh, for that reason it was 1674 before we had the first observation of some microbes. Um, this is supposedly the uh, Berkeley Mare, which is a lake, and um, this quote says, passing just lately over this lake, I took up a little of it in a glass vial, and examining water this, ne this water next day, I found floating therein. This is what Anthony von Leeuwenhoek found floating within. He drew some nice pictures of it. Uh, and one thirtieth the part of quantity of water as big as a millet seed, more than a thousand living creatures. So if you do the math on that, you end up with about 2.7 million creatures in one drop of water. So we uh, uh, humans have just had their first contact with these microorganisms. Most of these are protists and rotifers. Um, I think there's a bacteria drawn in here. What's interesting to me, what's most interesting to me about Anthony von uh, Leeuwenhoek is he's actually, um, he's into textiles. He's, that's his trade. He's not a microbiologist at all. Um, and he invented these, this is one of his microscopes here. He invented these microscopes as a way of inspecting textiles um, to look for fraying and things like that in the thread. And then he ends up using these to basically make a massive discovery uh, in, at least in, in the you know, world of living organisms. So it's interesting how you know textile person comes in invents a tool to, for one thing and then uses it to make a massive discovery in another. I feel like that's kind of happens in um, quite a lot in science. Now we're going to fast forward. That was 1670s. Now we're going to fast forward almost 200 years later to London. Um, at this point, people, this is what, industrial revolution. So people are, people are leaving rural areas. They're moving to cities for economic opportunity. So you end up with millions and millions of people living in cities that don't have any infrastructure at all. They have, you know, mud paths for horses, carts, foot traffic. There's no sewage. There's no really formalized water, drinking water system. And you have two and a half million people living together. And so what you end up with are these massive outbreaks of infectious disease, uh, which we now know as cholera. Then these people had no idea why everyone was dying. <coughs> um, so as I mentioned, yeah, 1800 to 1850, the London London's population tripled to 2.4 million people. Most people are getting their drinking water out of just hand pump wells or the Thames River, which is here. So most people are getting their water just straight from the environment and then drinking it. And so we end up with these. Um, large outbreaks of cholera, and um, you can see this is Paris in 1859. But this is, you know, what we might expect for a patient suffering from cholera. So the way cholera works is, um, you're feeling great, feeling fine, uh, all of a sudden diarrhea disease sets on, and the way cholera was kind of diagnosed was that the the, the fluids that were leaving your body were basically have these little white flecks in them, and it's basically your like intestinal cells like just sloughing off and coming out in huge amounts of liquid diarrhea. This uh, this bucket here is, is for what's coming out of these folks, and pretty much what happens is your body um, dehydrates, your electrolytes. You need electrolytes in your body. Your body can't keep up with the production of water, and this kind of like um, this condition sets in where your skin is very like <coughs> turbid, like you, you pinch your skin up and it doesn't go back down because it's you're completely dehydrated. And so people would die usually within 24 to 48 hours from basically this dehydration. Your organs fail, um, and so your family would be fine, healthy one day. And maybe by the end of the next week, three of five people are dead. Um, and people don't really know where this is coming from. And so obviously, it kind of just shows up, kills a bunch of people, and then disappears. 
And so the public at large is really freaking out about this as for good reason. Um, and doctors are kind of helpless beyond just, you know, providing some of the things to maybe make it like less, uh, quote, more comfortable, I guess you could say. And so at that time, there's, I, I, it's hard to communicate how much fear there was about cholera. And, and it's not even, they don't even know it's cholera yet. We call it cholera in hindsight. They just know thousands of people are dying in certain clusters of town. And so whole parts of London would empty out when one of these outbreaks would start. Everyone would just flee to the countryside if, if you had the means to do that. If you didn't have the means to do that, tough luck. Um, and so you would see cartoons like this. This is death rowing on the River Styx or uh, on the River Thames. So this is this is uh, the river that goes to the heart of London here, and uh, we have death cloaked in black. And so. The initial suspicion was like, okay, it's really smelly, like we know there's like these very terrible odors that are coming from our environment, from all the stuff we're dumping into it. And so the initial, the initial theory was, was my asthma, that's bad air. Um, and so foul smelling air was seen to be the, the origin of this disease. And so you can see here, this is, this is a, my asthma kind of hanging over, you can see the cloud here hanging, it's coming to stomp on everyone, you can see the armies of Europe kind of arrayed against this giant threat, this giant foot trying to fight it off. So people thought this was what was causing this disease. Um, you have the London Board of Health, and so, you know, obviously if you think that a disease is caused by bad smells and foul living conditions, you can imagine who ends up getting targeted for intervention. The poor people that move to the city, right, that live in squalor, that are there to work a job. And so the London Board of Health, uh, this is a cartoon, basically goes digging around. And so they use this as an opportunity to come into these neighborhoods and are like, oh, look how, like, look at the vile conditions these people live in. Of course they have disease and so they use this as a, as a reason to start like removing people, large uh, interventions to clean up and which is you know fine enough but you, got, you have to ask questions around who's, who's targeted and who's not and why. Um, and so the London board you know is heavily engaged in the community trying to figure this out and despite all this activity there are still these huge outbreaks of cholera where 10,000 people will die. And that brings us to our first uh, first person of interest, second person of interest really, is John Snow in 1854. Um, and he is, unbeknownst to himself, is going to found the field of epidemiology. And so um, John Snow is actually, um, he's an anesthesiologist. Um, so he's a physician, but you know, prior to John Snow's time, it was time for surgery. They basically give you a stick to bite on. Um, some whiskey maybe, um, and you just kind of gritted your teeth and went through surgery that way. Um, well, they figured out that they could um, aerosolize a, a certain gas and basically give you that gas to breathe, and it was a form of anesthesia, so you would go to sleep. And so he was actually the queen's uh, anesthesiologist. He provided the anesthesia for two of her children being born. And I guess... I don't really know why or how. I mean, my guess is he's making all these house visits to these cholera patients, and he's just curious about why this is happening. And so he begins mapping, in 1854, he begins mapping these cholera cases, and this is one particular outbreak of hundreds that are ha have happened. And what he finds is that these, out, these, these deaths, these are cholera deaths just in one neighborhood, kind of cluster around a single drinking water well. And so his theory is that um, this, this uh, disease is actually coming from the water. Uh, the cases cluster around the well. There's a brewery in this area that makes beer. None of the people working at that brewery get cholera. None of them die because they drink beer. Yeah, they're drinking beer. So none of them are getting sick. So there's just a lot of little anecdotes like that that allow him to kind of put together that I think this is coming from this, this hand pump. Um, but realistically, so many people flee because they're terrified that by the time
Tom John Snow removes the pump, uh, the, the handle on this pump, the outbreak was already tapering out because everyone had just fled. There was no one around. Um, but you can see, I mean, all those red dots, each of those red dots equals at least one death. Some of the bigger ones are two or three deaths. And this is in like two weeks uh, in one neighborhood. So you can see that this is quite terrifying. Um, and so epidemiology is kind of born out of this, uh, this moment, the idea of um, studying rates of disease amongst different populations and then relating, okay, the, the rate of disease amongst this particular population is elevated compared to the general population. What exposures has this group of people had that this group hasn't? And linking these exposures to disease. So the exposure here is this Broad Street pump. If you're exposed to this Broad Street pump, your likelihood of dying of cholera in those two weeks was much higher than the general population. That's how uh, John Snow kind of backed this out. Um, so here's John Snow. Here's the, the London Board of Health here. He, he folk on, uh, you know, kind of helpless, in dread. And then this is the, like, John Snow hero. So um, epidemiologists are really uh, proud of John Snow, as they should be. Um, so epidemiology is one lens we can bring to this problem, which is where, okay, let's look at rates of disease based on how different exposures are related to rates of disease. We can start to make inferences about which exposures actually are driving disease in communities. That's one way you can solve this problem. So here's the John Snow pump in London now. The handle's still off. Um, the John Snow pub is, is right here as well, so you can go in. I, I've not got to go there yet, but as soon as I'm in London, I'm definitely going straight to the John Snow pub to have a pint uh, in John Snow's honor. This is Vibrio cholera, which is really interesting because an Italian microbiologist found Vibrio cholera 1854-ish, but it wasn't, re it wasn't really until like the 1870s that this was widely known that, hey, this is caused by a bacteria that's getting in the water from poop. So the way things worked in London at that time is most houses had cesspools in the bottom of them. So basically you would take your, you know, your excrement from the day and throw it down in this cesspool. And there were, there were guys called uh, night soil, uh, night soil guys, and they would come and collect, at night, they would come and collect the night soil, which is like code for shit. And so, basically what was happening is the species was seeping through the ground into the Broad Street pump. So there was an infant. Um, there was an infant that had cholera and was staying in a house, basically right on the corner next to the pump. The feces from that infant was thrown down into the cesspool, and so they think that's where this outbreak started, was from this one infected infant. Um, so one of the real difficulties for us um, in microbiology is there are there are microbes everywhere, thousands of them. I mean, if we swab this desk surface, we would probably find you know thousands of bacteria per square you know, centimeter on this desk. The vast majority of them are harmless to us, uh, which is great. But the difficulty is how do we tell who's who amongst you know? If I, if I take a sample and I have Ten to the sixth bacteria in it. How do I look for the ones I'm interested in and ignore all the others? And that would really remain a, a big problem in microbiology up until the early 1900s. Um, so I've got this. Where's this is from a Where's Waldo book. So that's really kind of what microbiology is like. If you want to find Waldo, you basically have to go through like one by one looking at each person until you find what you're looking for. And that's what James Wilson is talking about here. He's trying to culture. Um, bacilli typhosis, which we know as Salmonella typhi, um, causes typhoid fever. Um, so he's trying to culture it from wastewater. But the problem he's having is that, quote, sewage contains such an enormous amount of bacteria that it is quite impracticable to examine more than a very small amount. So you can see he's done thousands of samples from sewage in, I believe, in Belfast. And on average, he, I 
isolates about 250,000 non-lactose fermenting colonies per centimeter cube. Within that same centimeter cube, you find one salmonella type E cell. So basically, he's having to culture 250,000 things at a time to find the one thing that he was interested in. And he's like, this is, this is a lot of work, so I'm going to try to invent a solution. So he, he finds this selective media, bismuth uh, sulfur auger, BSA. We actually still use this in uh, our business sulfite auger. We still use this to isolate uh, salmonella type B. And basically, the, it provides conditions so that the typosis forms a black colony, and these other coliforms are suppressed because of the bismuth and sodium sulfite. So these other bacteria can't grow in those agents. But salmonella type E can, and when it does, it forms a black colony. So this is kind of how we start getting around this. How do we, how can we measure exactly what we're interested in? How do we measure these germs that are causing disease? And so this is a, this is a BSA flakes here, and you can see these are streaked uh, salmonella type E colonies here. And basically, uh, over about five years, they look in wastewater from major cities all over the world, and guess what? They find salmonella typhi all over the place. During outbreaks of typhoid fever, the number of these pathogens go up in the sewage. And so you can imagine that if you're taking your sewage, and you're just dumping it into the river without any treatment, all these bacteria are, you know, looking for their next host. So this is 1933, and that's really how this still works to this day, is um, we have some human population, and some people in this human population are infected with some pathogen. The way pathogens work is they have to replicate in a host cell. The pathogens that we're interested in are the ones that are adapted to our cells. Um, they need us in order to replicate. Usually, a lot of them, as they're replicating, they're also doing damage to our internal systems, and so our immune system responds, and we end up sick. And so what's, what's interesting about fecal oral pathogens, the reason they're called fecal oral pathogens, is they're shed in our feces. Most of them replicate in our intestines. So they're shed in our feces. Um, so our feces goes out carrying these microbes, and our feces ends up in some place where polyphys isn't supposed to be, and then it ends up in someone's mouth. Um, and so really our goal in, uh, in my field, my goal, I won't, I won't project this goal on all of y'all, my goal is to keep doo-doo out of people's mouths, um, and that is why water and wastewater treatment from a microbiology perspective exists. And this is really what drove all of the development in these in these areas in like the late late 1800s, early 1900s. This is all driven by public health. Um, people are dying. We don't want people to die, so we better treat our sewage. Um, and that's what happened in London. Is in the, in the late 1800s in London, literally, you know, hundreds of millions of public dollars were invested in building sewer systems. These sewer systems didn't actually treat the sewage. They just collected it all, funneled it down the Thames River, and then dropped it off so that it wasn't dropped off like upstream of the drinking water uh, points. Eventually, we get more savvy, right? And we're like, okay, we're going to treat our sewage, and then we'll discharge it, and we're also going to treat our water. And so the idea here is to build like multiple barriers between these pathogens getting in our mouths uh, and these different exposure routes. So environmental microbiology, you know, this started with Hans Nee von Leeuwenhoek, is basically observing these microbes in the environment. Um, this is the F diagram here. I think I've got a bigger version of this coming up. So my work is really there's, I mean, there are a lot of different things that I do, but these are two of the ways. So in, in QMRA, what we typically do is we look at these exposure routes and we look, we measure the microbes in these different routes. For instance, like in water drinking water. How many of these pathogens do we find? Based on what we find, and we'll just call it math, we can estimate how many people get, are likely to get sick. Wastewater-based epidemiology, which has really exploded in response to SARS-CoV-2, 
2 and everyone's looking for SARS-CoV-2 and poop water now. Um, and so this idea is like these people are already infected and are shedding the material and by looking at how much they're shed, how much is shed we can use math to see how many people in this population are actually affected. So there's one that looks forward in time and one that looks back in time. Um, the F diagram, almost everything starts with F. Um, this is really where we as environmental engineers have a lot to add because really all the epidemiologists are interested in is this new host. Who's getting sick? How many? What rate? Um, and of course, the reason that person gets sick, like if you kind of black box this, there's a reason they get sick, and it's all it's this whole system over here. And this is where the environmental engineering comes in. Is okay, this species is moving through these environmental compartments through fluids like drinking water, um, surface water. One of my favorite fluids right now, air. Um, Fields, this is like land applying manure, land applying, you know, uh, treated sewage. Flies, so flies can actually, um, I showed you that latrine slab in Maputo. The reason it's important that it be sealed is because flies like to go down and uh, chow down on feces. And then they like to come and land on food and chow down on that too. So they're mechan this is a mechanical vector. So they can get feces on their feet and then land on your food. Um, fingers, so you don't wash your hands after you use the bathroom. You know, I don't. You're not going to infect yourself, probably. But uh, I don't know if you. I guess it's been about maybe eight or nine years ago now. Chipotle had like massive norovirus outbreaks. Yeah, it was because somebody was getting norovirus from their doo, -doo on their hands and then making their own burritos. So this still happens all the time. Um, so this is the F diagram and. Uh, it ends up in a new host, and so of course this person gets sick, and then now their feces has this in it, and thus the circle of life. So, um, you know, epidemiology is really going to look at rates of disease, and then some of the exposures that they might consider would be, you know, who has access, what's the rate of disease amongst those with access to improved sanitation compared to those without access? <laughs> What's the rate of disease, diarrhea disease amongst those with access to high drinking water uh, compared to those without? And the problem is this is a network, right? So even if you have high drinking water, there's plenty of other ways, spills, slides, fingers, for you to end up infected. So tons of money and resources have been spent doing these massive trials with you know tens of thousands of people to look at you know, does giving someone access to pipe drinking water decrease diarrheal disease? And most of the time, these studies find. What do you think they find? You just had to like spitball, take a guess. How, how good a job do you think we're doing? We are not doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> because. <laughs> The way this network works is, let's say I come in and I get, I improve the drinking water, right? Okay, now I'm like, I've chopped off this arrow, right? I'm treating the drinking water, so I'm keeping, if there's feces in the water, I'm getting it out. So this drinking water is looking really, really great. But then the person who goes to the tap stand and collects the drinking water has poop on their fingers. They carry the water back, touch the spigot serve it in a cup with their fingers and then the next person drinks it. So there's just so many ways to circumvent that if you don't approach this in like a systems thinking, basically what you're always going to find is uh, no effect. So improved, uh, This it's actually really interesting because if you think about it, we all know, right, that improved drinking water and improved sanitation improves disease, like decreases diarrheal disease. That's like, we can all intuit that very easily, but it is the studies that definitively prove that from like a statistical point of view are exceptionally rare. Um, and so there's plenty of people that are like, why continue investing in this if it doesn't work? So we have a lot of work to do as environmental engineers. So here's our access to pipe drinking water. We're blocking off the fluids here. 
Um, here's our hand washing, so we provide hand washing resources, and then here's our access to improved sanitation. So um, this is where we basically just like keep the feces off of, you know, from getting in the environment in the first place, which is, a, I think, a great strategy. Um, and so the idea is that we use these different interventions to intervene on different points of this web. And if you look historically at a lot of these developed countries where this has happened, right, beginning in like eight, late 1800s to 1950, the amount of economic mobility at that time was just massive. I mean, people went from living like 12 people in one house with um, getting their water from a hand pump to like modern suburban housing with piped water, piped sewage, hardwood floors. I mean, there's all there. There are a ton of interventions that happened at once, such that people were no longer getting these diseases. It wasn't just like, well, you still live in a shack with 12 people, but here's a piped drinking water source. That wasn't how it unfolded. And so it's a little bit crazy that we would think that that's how it'll work elsewhere. It's probably not the case. So yeah, all these exposures and looking at disease outcomes, that epidemiology. The problem is they're kind of treating this whole network as a black box. Um, they really don't want to get into all that. The, the good news for us is that's kind of what we're good at. We're good at fate and transport of chemicals and microbes through the environment such that they end up in people's mouths and hopefully preventing that from happening. So environmental microbiology, what we do is we, we know who the players are in the poop. And so we start looking for them in these different compartments, right? We can look. We can look in people's feces directly. We can look in fluids, right? We can look in. I mean, that has a filter. Presumably, it has a filter in it. I could pop that out, take some of that filter, start looking at who's in there. We'd probably find some crazy stuff. Um, drinking water, same thing. So this is what I've spent probably the last ten years doing: is basically like chasing these microbes around, trying to understand like how do they get where they get? How do we stop that from happening? They're really good at circumventing our controls um, and ending up in a new host. So now I'm going to start with like the picture show, I guess. Uh, I've spent time in several places. Uh, my understanding is you're maybe going to go to Nicaragua. Sorry that didn't uh, that didn't work out. But um, in 2006, I lived in Nicaragua for about six weeks. So. Um, I was working with an NGO there, uh, so basically I was just embedded with their drinking water team. So just kind of, this was before I started my PhD, actually uh, Dr. Snow's advisor, uh, Dr. Kim, I was meeting with him. I'd done really well in graduate school up to that point, and, uh, and I kind of told him, I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to go like try to be an engineer in, a, in another country and like see if I can help, and he was like, well, I think if you're going to do that, you should like get a test test drive, right? You should go see what that, that's actually like. So I ended up in Nicaragua for the summer as a test drive. Um, this is a little uh, village called Ronto Pondo. So spent a lot of time working there. Um, beautiful place, really kind, generous people. Um, and so we were working on a water system for them. So Here's our, these are our solar panels. So this is a groundwater system. So we're using these solar panels. There's a, there's a well uh, drilled right here where all these folks are. We were hand drilling a well right there, which was freaking crazy. Um, actually, no, we mechanically drilled the well. Then we had to lower the casing in. So there's a, there's a, obviously to pump water out of the ground, you need the pipes to do that, right? And you need the pipes to do that to be resistant to corrosion. So they're heavy metal pipes that you have to lower like section by section, like, I don't know, I think we did maybe, not even that much, maybe 200 feet. But each section of pipe weighs, I don't know, maybe like 20, 30 pounds. So you stack those up where you have like, I don't know, 50 sections. And so basically the way you do this is you have these giant like wrench things. It's almost like a, a C with a long, uh, metal neck on it, and what you do is you lever that up, and then you just stand there and hold it. And you got eight guys that are like levering up on this thing, while the next the next person is screwing on the next section, 
then one by one you sh you like you lower and then you shift your little C clamp up to the next section and basically like stick by stick you have to lower this thing into the ground. It took us I think it took us like eight hours that day. So that's what we're getting ready to do. So we need energy to pump the water up out of the ground into our solar cells. Um, we need a place to store all the water that we pump out of the ground. So here's our tank. And this house here houses the controls for the pump. I don't I can't remember if this was chlorinated or not. Um, a lot of times people assume that groundwater is clean, uh, which is a terrible assumption. Um, I can't remember if we were chlorinating or not. Um, but in this community there were a lot of cattle. Uh, they they used uh, cows to make to make money so they raised cows. And um, <coughs> one of the obviously one of the issues with that is like cow feces, right? That gets washed down into the groundwater back into clean issue. Things like cryptosporidium are uh, love cows and they'll infect us as well. Um, the other challenge is cryptosporidium are resistant to chlorine. So um, but yeah, we installed this system over the summer, uh, working with teams of, of students that came down and commissioned it and started it up. So this is kind of like, this is what water supply looks like in Rancho Pondo, uh, Nicaragua. A bit different from the way we do it here, but still, the goal is the same. The goal is to keep poop out of people's mouths. Um, so what I want you to hold on to as I flip through all this stuff is that, you know, despite the fact that it looks different, the goal is the same. It's just how do you achieve that goal with context appropriate resources. Um, so that's Rancho Pondo. Um, I worked with the engineering team. I can't remember which town this was, but you can see these are. This is a map of the water distribution network here, and it kind of makes a big loop. So you want to loop your. All of you have taken hydraulics, right? You want to you want to loop the pipe network because it's more efficient from a hydraulic point of view because basically the the pressure is provided by two separate uh, flows, and then also. Um, Long one-way systems from a water quality perspective, long one-way pipes that aren't looped are really bad for water quality because what happens is the only time water is moving through this pipe is when it's looped. It's like if this were a one-way pipe from here to here, the only time the water would be moving along that pipe is if someone here was using it. So what happens is you end up with stagnation. So it might take, if there are a gallon of water here, it might take it like depending upon how rapidly these people use water, it could take it a week to make it all the way through the line, in which case there's no more chlorine in it. Who knows what's reburned in it? So that's stagnation. So that's why we loop our loop our system. And you can see I basically draw a carbon copy of that on this notebook. So I was doing some hydraulic modeling, basically trying to estimate, okay, if our well, if our tank is here and the water is at this, the water elevation is this, what's the pressure going to be for this house here? Is the pressure going to be sufficient for them to capture using water and how much will they be able to use per day? Um, this is one of the drilling rigs. So just from like a practical point of view, right, we had to bring this drilling rig in to drill a hole. This is in, I want to say Mina de Agua. It was definitely not a water mine, though, but that's what it was called. Um, and so to get this drilling rig in, literally, we're having to, like, chop these tree limbs down. So even something simple like, oh, we're just going to drive this truck back in and di dig a hole. Like, it took us, like, hours of chopping all these trees with machetes to get this drilling rig to, like, the place where the well was supposed to be drilled. So it's, like, little things like that. Um, this is a team of students. Uh, that picture I showed of like the water system outline, this is them actually building that system. So we're, we're digging the, the ditches here where the pipeline is going to be buried. So it's actually that point I was pointing out, like far point, that's the corner right here. And then the, it's going to turn and go that way to close the loop. Um, so we're digging out the trenches. I've spent a ton of time digging trenches. That's when I was like, mm, maybe I don't want to be an engineer in, the, in another country. I don't know. Um, tons of just like super hard work. Um, digging through this. This is volcanic uh, gravel. So it's like super hard. And I mean, it, was, it was type 2 fun, I guess. Uh, we needed to, I, I mentioned the water tank, right? We needed to have the water level in the tank such that the pressure was adequate for everyone to use it. So this is us building the water, water tank. 
Um, this was a really difficult day because basically this entire slab of con this concrete and rebar here, this entire slab had to be poured in one pour. And the thing is, like, you don't in Nicaragua, you don't like call up the concrete company and have a truck drop off like you know ten cubic yards of concrete. You hand mix your concrete with sand you dig out of the ground and, and, and rock you dig out of the ground. So we spent all day basically like digging sand. We had two like this is a this this is a concrete mixer that's literally like you spin it by hand. And so for I think it took us like 15 hours. We just mixed concrete and scooped concrete into this, and we would just like rotate into different jobs like all day long to keep from getting too tired. And uh, more, uh, that, I don't know if that was quite too fun. I don't know if I'd ever say that was fun. <laughs> but um, this is us bringing together a, a water meter. So each of the houses is, is our, actually I think this might be a meter for the wellhead. So we want to meter how much we take out of the ground so that we can kind of have a feel for how much water the community is using. Um, so we're installing a meter and you know we're having to use these pipe wrenches to kind of like piece everything together fitting by fitting. Um, I learned a lot about plumbing that summer. It was, it was pretty cool. And then this is when we finally we hooked up the wellhead for the first time and so people are starting to come to get this is the first path. The wellhead is right here so this goes down to the ground and then people were able to come and fill up their uh, buckets of water. So that was kind of cool. That was like one of the first uh, like active wells that we brought on when I was there that summer. Uh, Jamaica. So I worked on the Engineers Without, Border, uh, Engineers Without Borders project uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, there's a community in J Jamaica called Brayhead. So we met a, met a woman that lived there and was really adamant on trying to improve the drinking water system for, for her community. And so really when you first show up in this place, it's just like, my general approach is like, say very little, listen very much, and let the people tell you like what the issue is. Because sometimes what happens is you show up and you think you know what the issue is, and that's actually not the issue at all. And so you have to listen to figure that out. And so we start digging through the jungle, just absolutely beautiful place in the mountains of Jamaica. Um, and their, their water comes from a spring. So this is the spring here. It's really hard to see, but there's just a little bit of water coming through here. They're, they basically have a pipe that comes out right here. This is the pipe going through the, through the bush. Um, and most of it is just kind of like duct tape together, right? This community is just like, this is what we have. Let's just like make it work somehow. And so you end up with these interesting situations with like pipes running through the jungle. I brought over some like wa basic water quality stuff. So we were measuring things like turbidity, E. coli, basically just trying to get a feel for like what's the base level water quality in this community? Is it is it degraded? Um, so we did a lot of membrane filtration. Um, this is Jonathan working on some membrane filtering, uh, some surface water nearby because people basically people only use the spring for drinking. For all their other water needs, they go to this like surface water source. Like, so what people do is that they'll have two different plumbings in their house. They'll have one that comes from the spring for drinking, they'll have another plumbing for like washing clothes, and that other plumbing is coming from this surface water source. We found E. coli. Uh, this is, yeah, this is, this is the house where we were staying, so I tested some water just because we were like, well, we need to test our own water, so we found some E. coli there. Kind of cool. Um, unless you're drinking it. Uh, yeah, so these are just little low-cost E. coli membrane filters. And really one of the biggest challenges when we first showed up is just kind of like figuring out how this thing worked. Um, we spent a ton of time bushwhacking the jungle trying to follow these pipes. So this is the, this is the water from the spring. So we spent so much time trying to find these pipes. We even had a local who, like, this guy was, like, the water system dude. Like, he knew all about it. And we still, like, couldn't map the whole thing. It took us a week to do it. We found some really interesting stuff. Like, and this is why, you know, earlier I said engineers is not the, like, weak point. Here's some engineering. Bamboo. It's been, like, cut in half and kind of viewed out. And it's holding up this pipe that's crossing the gully in the middle of the, of the bush. But one of the issues in this community is that some of these... Some of the places where this pipe was routed were used for farming, and so these farmers would do these con controlled burns, and so they would literally like burn a plastic pipe. So this is kind of charred plastic pipe. It's a uh, some in some places the pipe is literally like open, like physically open. So it was it was more like a like a Roman aqueduct than like a closed pipe. 
the local bar, but we had a great time, and the idea was just like, meet the community, find out what the problem was, interact with them, and see if we can like help. Um, so over the course of, let's say we got some repeats in here. I know we're wrong. Over the course of, I do have repeats. Well, let's see. That means I don't have as many slides. So over the course of like two years, we started to try to work on this project. Um, unfortunately, the there was a, a key woman who lived in the community who was really like the de facto leader. She ended up getting a visa to come to the U.S. So she moved to the U.S. And we went back to the community a few times and like basically just had a really hard time. Like no, there was no one to take her place. It just left a big vacuum in the community. And I really, even to this day, don't know. We made a design. We had a design. We had everything kind of mapped out. We had sourced local materials to build it. Uh, we had kind of like negotiated back and forth with the community because they really wanted to just run a pipe through the jungle again. Um, but we were like, let's not do that because it's going to get burned. Let's go this other way that follows a road. It's long, but it was a lot longer. So they were like, we don't want to bury all this pipe for twice as long. And so we really had to like sell them on why that was important. Like, hey, you can access it to maintain it. It's not going to get burned. If you bury it correctly, it's not going to be like cracked open and have stuff leaking into it. And so eventually they were like, okay, that we'll sign on to that. And so they signed on, but um, unfortunately when our contact left, it became, just was really difficult to like secure resources. And so I don't know if the team at Georgia, I really don't actually know the status of this project at this point uh, in Jamaica, which is sad, but. Um, I spent a lot of time in India, t summer 2015, uh, 2017. I, got, I was a Fulbright Scholar in Nagpur, India, which is the tiger capital of the world. Um, and I spent nine months working at the National Environmental Engineering Research Institute, so the Indian Government Institute. Um, the Ganga River is, most of you've all heard of the Ganga, right? So the Ganga is like the, the mother river of India. Um, it's a very it's very culturally and spiritually important. And so uh, this is uh, a city called Hardwar, which is one of the places where ritual bathing in the Ganga is really really popular. It's a holy site. Um, so people come from all over India to bathe here. So I of course came. Uh, I did not bathe, but I did get a, a jar of holy water uh, to, to take home. So this is kind of what hard water looks like. It's just a massive river. Uh, but this river really is, you know, the lifeblood of, of, uh, of this region of India. So when we think about India, the picture looks a little bit different. We have these massive cities. Uh, you can see this is, uh, this is in Delhi. So this is Chandi Chalk. Uh, near the spice market in Old Delhi, and you can see the utilities here. These are all the electrical wires. People just everywhere. Um, and this is a uh, this is a public toilet in Mumbai. And then this is actually in my house in India. So every day I would filter my drinking water. So this is called household water treatment. So sometimes when the government can't provide clean drinking water at each house, the house is kind of left on their own. So someone to manage their water for them at their house. Um, but if you're, if you're just middle or lower class, you basically plan your day around that water. Um, this is in Mumbai. So you can see, you know, compared to the pictures I showed you of the Ganga, this is the surface water in Mumbai. And so you've got three hanging toilets here. 
that the people living in these buildings probably use. Um, so this is, you know, in some place, like these places aren't homogenous, right? Like just because you have a, you know, five-star hotel in Mumbai, I, I mean, literally I stayed in a five-star hotel like two miles from here, right? So I'm like pooping in a toilet. These people are, are using hanging toilets. A lot of the sewage, even if you, even if you're using a toilet, that sewage may not necessarily be treated before it's discharged into the environment. And so this is kind of what, what it looks like. <coughs> it's a bit shocking. From a drinking water perspective, uh, tanker trucks are really big in India, so you'll have these centralized water points. They'll come and fill this tanker truck, and then this tanker truck will go to a neighborhood that doesn't have access to pipe water. Everyone comes to the truck. Uh, everyone has their own little hose. So you like basically like clamber up on top of this truck and you chunk your family's hose in. You start to siphon. You siphon the water and then dump it in your bucket. And basically you like try to fill up your buckets before everybody else is filled up there before the truck gets drained. So this is like when this truck shows up, it can kind of be chaos. It's like organized. To us, to me, it looks like chaos, but it's like very organized, like who's doing what at what time and what, like the order of who gets to go, all that is organized by the community. Um, this is in the town of Masuri, which is in the foothills of uh, the Himalayan mountains. And you can see here, this is everyone's little service line uh, going down to the main water line. So basically everyone puts in their own little line. So all the houses on this street are represented here with their own little some of which just like go through the middle of the wall. Things, I mean, it's just like ad hoc, ad hoc, very ad hoc. Um, this picture in the middle is in the town where I lived in Nagpur. So the way it works in Nagpur, I told you the water comes on every like 45 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes in the evening. This is a, this is like a middle class house. So what they have here is a giant cistern. This is a huge concrete well. And when the water comes on, and basically this pipe here just like fills their cistern. And then what they do is they have a pump that pumps from the cistern, you can see the pump here, pumps from the cistern up onto up into tanks that are on their rooftop. And so from their rooftop down they have what we call virtual 24 by 7 water. So it, in the house it looks like 24 by 7 water but it's not really. And so I was studying the water quality, when it comes to these systems that aren't pressurized all the time, we think that that's a great opportunity for probably pathogens to enter the system when you depressurize it. So I was looking at, okay, when this water is delivered, are there pathogens in it? So that's what I'm doing here. I've got tap water coming in. I'm pumping it through this filter, using a meter to measure how much I pump through, and then I can look in it for uh, pathogens. Um, hosted a few students and worked with some fantastic Indian engineers. These guys really like basically opened all the doors for me to meet people, to come to people's houses. It was kind of funny. I, I was very laissez-faire in India. Like I, I would eat whatever, I would drink whatever. I, so I would go to people's houses and of course these guys like work for the local utility, right? So I show up at the house and the people uh, like take a sample and people are like, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, do, do you want some water you know, to drink? And I'm like, I can't say no because I'm one of these utility dudes, but I know what's in this water because I'm measuring it. So I definitely <laughs> drank. I, I definitely drank a lot of uh, cups of water that were like probably pretty questionable. I only got to, I got violently ill three times over nine months, so yeah, that's pretty good, I think. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, and I hosted hosted two uh, students from Georgia Tech. They uh, they came over and it was it was awesome. This is us at the. Uh, water treatment plant. So we not only test it out in the neighborhood, we also test at the treatment plant. Um, you know, I showed you lots of pictures of like stereotypical India, but there's also like this India. Um, this is in the um, foothills. Foot hills. This is like 10,000 feet. So as high as, you know, highest mountain in, in the U.S. and this is the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, really beautiful town there called Missouri uh, and Landauer, so we did a lot of hiking there. This is the sunset there one night. You can see this is, I think, I think the top of this hill is something like 12,000 feet, but it's called a hill. That's a hill um, in India. So we did a lot of hiking around there, and it was, it was a wonderful experience. So all I have to say, you should consider a full ride. Um, 
Fulbright is, I think engineering students are exceptionally rare in Fulbright. And so for that reason, like, if you can pull together a reasonable project, you have a good shot. Um, there's a lot, you know, countries all over the world that you can go and work. Uh, Bolivia, Bolivia is like my all-time favorite. It is unbelievably beautiful. So um, here we have, these are the Andes Mountains here. Uh, right outside La Paz. So La Paz, Bolivia is basically a massive city, millions of people. It's in a giant bowl. And um, it's grown so much over time that the city has grown up out of the bowl. And now you have uh, a region called El Alto, the tall, which is people on the plateau above the bowl. And then right outside of that are the Andes Mountains, like 14,000 feet. So you're, look, you're standing in the middle of the town and looking up at these huge mountains. Actually, they're way taller than 14,000 feet. They're like 20,000 feet. Um, Snow-capped mountains. This is at 14,000 feet. Um, so we traveled with a class, and basically what's happening here is they have a big mining pit. So this is some mining up here. That's, uh, I, I can't remember what they were mining out. And so we, we went way up above the city and said, okay, we're going to look at the water quality like here, and then we're going to look at it as it travels through the city and like see what happens. And you can imagine what's happening. We partner with uh, a local university, uh, Universidad Mayor de San Andreas, which is in uh, La Paz. So these are Bolivian students that we worked with all week. And you can see the dead and ultra filter here, basically fishing for microbes. Um, yeah, unbelievably beautiful place. This is uh, just one of our like hangout days when we were kind of trying to acclimate. So when you land in you, when you land in La Paz, you get off the plane at like 14,000 feet. And so they have a bunch of oxygen tanks there for the gringos. So it's really like you fly through the night, you leave Miami at like 10 p.m., you land at 5 a.m. in La Paz at 14,000 feet, and you feel like like you're in a fishbowl. It's just really a weird experience. So our first day there, we usually com completely take off and just hang out to like acclimate to the altitude. So this is our acclimation day. Um, just hanging out by the river. This is a this is a far well. He's really a rancher, a vaquero, um, that lives. His family lives here, just downstream of this mine. So they raise uh, alpacas and llamas. And we were chatting with him about the glacier because if you notice here, like this, like all used to be covered in glacier. And it's basically receded to where you can't even see it. So we were we were having a conversation with him about, you know, he's he he had been there for like 70 years and was telling us all about like, oh, you know, 40 years ago the glacier used to be like here, and um, just like crazy crazy. Uh, you can see the impacts of climate change in Bolivia in a huge way. Um, So one of the things that we were looking for is uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So this, that river that I showed you way up in the mountains, this is what that river now looks like in La Paz. So this is the um, Choqueyapu. So the Choqueyapu starts way up in the mountains, comes down through the city. As it moves through the city, there's really no real sewage treatment. People, people have uh, pipes that come down the hill from their house and just go straight into the river. So all the sewage is just oops, straight in. So what we're doing here is um, up here, <coughs> you can see this is my friend Olivia here. She has an air sampler. So she's sampling uh, the fluid air for pathogens. And we're down here sampling the fluid water for the same pathogen. So the idea is like, can we, can we pair up? So this is coming over these, these are, these are called chachadas. So the idea here is if uh, when the water cascades over, it introduces oxygen. We need oxygen for biodegradation of uh, this organic material, but it also creates like a plume. Um, so we were all disgusting after that day because we stood up here in this, on top of this pipe and the, the wind was blowing back up the hill. So we were just completely covered in fecal plume, I guess. I don't know what you want to call it, but um, so we. We were looking for antibiotic resistant bacteria because that's a huge issue. That's going to be probably like, once the SARS CoV 2 pandemic like winds down, this is probably the next pandemic you're going to start hearing about is people dying of 
infections that we don't have antibiotics to treat. Um, you can see these are, so what we've done is we've isolated E. coli from this, we've streaked it over this auger plate. Each one of these discs is an antibiotic. If the antibiotic works, there should be a big clean circle because there shouldn't be any microbes able to grow in that space. And you can see here, resistant to this, resistant to this, this. So look, we're like resistant to four of six. Even these, like this is like, this is, I think, ampicillin. And you can see that it's like not fully resistant, uh, but it's got partial resistance to ampicillin. This is diprofloxin here, um, which is maybe like the best one, but definitely Lots of antibiotic resistant E. coli around. Uh, this is us. Here's our little pump, our dead end ultra filter. So, again, we're like taking this water and filtering it through our ultra filter to look for pathogens. This is at like 12 or 13,000 feet. There's a, there's a research observatory up here on top of this mountain. Actually, it might be up here. But it's like this road is super sketchy. And so we started trying to go up in like a bus. And then we were like, mm, this is a bad idea. <laughs> so we turned around and we set up here to sample. And this is our air sampler here. So the idea is like, in these pristine environments, what do we find? Um, I'm, not, I'm not really an expert on the air stuff. But I know for a fact that what we actually find is that these microbes can literally like move through the atmosphere. Like they can go up into the atmosphere and move long distances and then come back down. So microbes from China can cross the Pacific and land on the, and be deposited on the west coast of the U.S. It's very, very easy for that to happen. So uh, we started, we were staying at a hotel, Hotel Calicoto. We started uh, what we called Hotel Calicoto Labs Incorporated basically commandeered this room and turned it into a microbiology lab, which ended up being a terrible idea. So basically every night we would, we would be up to like 3 or 4 in the morning processing all our samples and these are, the ones that have turned green have E. coli in them. I don't know how, somehow like this ended up on the carpet maybe. <laughs> There's like a green, giant green spot on the carpet. We got our deposit back. I don't know how we got our deposit. I would not have given us our deposit back. We cleaned it up as, as best as we could, but yes, Hotel Calicoto Labs. Um, this is a uh, coca. So coca leaves are a big part of Bolivian culture. They help with the, like altitude uh, sickness, and so chewing coca, like everybody chews coca in India or in uh, Bolivia. And so we chewed a lot of coca. This is our hike. We went to a place called Valley of the Moon and went on a hike and it was great. We actually found like rocks with fossils in them, like fossilized ferns. I mean, it was, it was wild. Um, but, but coca leaves are like a huge part of Bolivian culture and a huge part of why Bolivia does not like, the Bolivian government does not like the U.S. government because the U.S. government basically did a bunch of like shenanigans in Bolivia trying to stop the growth of coca leaves because they're used to make cocaine. So, um, the coca farmers like basically revolted against U.S. Uh, you know, I don't know what the politically correct term is. I call it shenanigans, but basically like, the U.S. government violating the sovereignty of another country, and the coca farmers were like, "We've had enough," and so they elected a, uh, a coca farmer as the president. He's been the president ever since. <laughs> that tends to be how these things go. Um, so yeah, coca leaves. Um, stepping back a little bit, so that's kind of like all over the world what this looks like, um, to talk about pathogens in general. Right now in the U.S., our standard, when we, when we talk about drinking water, our standard is like acceptable risk, right? You have to decide before the fact how, much ri how many bad health outcomes are acceptable because you're never going to get to zero. Um, and so in the, in the U.S. we tend to think like one infection among 10,000 people annually for drinking water. Um, and so what's interesting is when you take this one person in 10,000, which is also like basically completely made up by the way, um, it just kind of became like referenced so much that it became like the standard. If you take this and you use what I mentioned earlier, QMRA, and you kind of work backwards, so you say, okay, this is my allowed probability, how many microbes would it take to like represent that risk? 
when we think about uh, a pathogen like Campylobacter, right, this is a bacterial pathogen. So for an one annual infection risk of 1 in 10,000, if you have 3.14 colony forming units of Campylobacter in 100,000 liters of water, you've exceeded this standard. Cryptosporidium, so this is a protozoan pathogen. If you have 4.79 cryptosporidium in a million liters of water, you have violated this standard. Rotavirus, um, if you have like six, this is called a foci forming unit, basically just like one unit is equal to one viral particle. In 10 million liters, then you've exceeded that threshold. So let's take Baton Rouge, right? So we need to be like we need to look in at least 100,000 liters to see if there's Campylobacter. How many how many hundred thousand liters of water do you think we test on an annual basis in a city like that? Right? You just have to guess. Never. What's that? Never. Never. I hope not. Never. <laughs> that could be. It's possible. We maybe. I I would be shocked if they test 100 liters. Most of the time we're like going and taking a grab sample, right? So we take a liter. And we actually filter maybe like 100 mil of that liter, and we might do that like three or four times a year at different places in the city. So maybe 40 grab samples of 100 mil each. So like a half liter of water. But you can see that like to actually verify this standard, you're gonna have to do a lot more than that. Um, and so basically, long story short, we have these standards, but like, are they real? We can't even measure them. Do they mean anything if you can't measure them? Um, the other thing about microbes is, um, not to bash on chemists, but, you know, I told you, what, something like three, three to six of these different organisms. So here's ten organisms, and if you convert that to moles, like ten to the or minus twenty-three moles, like the equivalent. So. As microbiologists, when it comes to like looking for these microbes in the environment, we're talking like, what is this, like yocto, yocto moles of material that we're looking for. So, you know, it's, it's a tough game to play because it's, these, these microbes like vary in time and space, right? So like, if you go to the water fountain right now and take a sample and you go 30 minutes from now, that's not the same stuff. Uh, so. The problem is quite, quite difficult. Um, so I'm interested in like tools for getting around that, um, tools for overcoming those difficulties. Uh, you've seen a lot of these ultra filters in the photographs. So this is like an ultra filtration setup in the lab. Um, <coughs> so we take our water sample here, we pump it through. This ultra filter basically will catch everything, even proteins. Um, this is actually used for kidney dialysis traditionally. And so what we're doing is we're repurposing it to capture microbes, and we'll flush those microbes out. This is a sample from the Ganga River. So it's got all that is like sediment and stuff from the river that's been captured. Um, about 15 bucks just for the filter. So it's quite expensive, right? So this is not going to be appropriate for resource limited settings. Um, you can see our ultra filter, we get viruses, colloidal silica, there's tobacco smoke. Definitely get bacteria. Um, here's a Giardia cyst, cryptosporidium. So we're, when we use ultra filtration, we're catching almost everything, um, with the exception of some ions and sugars and dyes. So this is what this looks like in a lot of different settings. This is a uh, this is my little kit that I travel with. This is my chai tea right here in India. I drank a lot of chai tea. It was awesome. Um, so basically everywhere you go, you set up shop, then you have tea, then you take a sample, then you have tea, and then you leave. Um, this is another spot in India. So you can see I've got this hooked straight to the tap. My pump is pumping through this filter. This is during monsoon, so it's raining a ton. So I've got my umbrella set up. This is in... Bolivia. So basically ultra filtering a lot of water. Uh, this is 120 liters. So basically I was limited by my batteries here. So when the batteries run out of juice, you just can't filter anymore. 
Um, so usually in India I would filter 120 liters. When you back flush your filter, you end up with like 450 milliliters roughly to 500. Um, that's this material. So this is actually from the water treatment plant. So this is at the entrance to the water treatment plant. This is after flocculation, coagulation. This is after rapid sand filtration. You can see it is getting like cleanish, which is good. Um, so we've achieved about 267x concentration. We take that same material and we spin it in a centrifuge and we pellet the suspended solids. So this is, I've taken 50 mil and pelleted the material that was suspended in it. So now I'm at about 2,400 times uh, concentration. And then I take that pellet and resuspend it in a little bit of a buffer. And then this buffer we can take and test, look for different microbes. Um, Ganga tree, India. So this is in the foot, uh, foothills of the Himalayas. So that's the Ganga River coming out of, like, like the glacier where the Ganga River starts is like right up here around this corner. Um, I don't think I want to go into all this right now. I think really I want to get to here. Um, this is typhoid fever in the United States. So we started uh, chlorinating our drinking water in 1908, and you can see typhoid fever drops off. This is in a this is in our major cities though. Um, so also in the United States, there's rural populations, right, that don't have access to, you know, don't necessarily have access to these water treatment plants. So it's very tempting to be like, there's the developing world, and then there's the developed world, which are categories that were created by, like, the World Bank to describe economies. But in real countries with real people, the country's not homogenous, right? So, <coughs> You know, the, the context is going to vary. And so we should not forget that in the United States, actually here in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, next door, um, there are conditions that I would argue are just like those that I've seen elsewhere. Um, this is Catherine Coleman Flowers. She's a community leader in the Black Belt of Alabama. And this is a cesspool where someone's sewage is coming out of there their home, and they can't, the, the ground doesn't, like septic tanks don't work there. And so um, there's, this is a big problem in Alabama. Um, this is water from Flint, Michigan with lead in it. There's a lead outbreak going on in Benton Harbor, Michigan now. Uh, and then this is something I picked up from Louisiana. Um, so there's like over 100 boil water notices every year. Some of them last as long as 200 days out of 365. So basically communities where the water utility is not providing potable water. Um, so this is not a developing country thing. This is like a, a people with resources and people with, without resources thing. So there are lots of opportunities to get engaged in that here in Louisiana, here in the US. So um, I'll just park it there and leave that with you. Think about what you're going to do with it. Um, happy to take any questions. Well, uh, apparently it's 120. So any questions? My bad. No. Thank you. Thank you.